Um, we used momentum charts just as a way of keeping track of everything. You can also keep track of things using, using math. <laughs> if, uh, you can write a vector like delta p in terms of the components, the x and y components, the horizontal and vertical parts of it. You could also write a, a, a z component, but that makes it three dimensional and I'm not going to do much of that, certainly not going to draw any pictures with three dimensions, but p sub z should be there. The force, the net force is a vector, so the sum of the forces, the sum of the x components and the sum of the y components Uh, that sum of the x components is the x component of the sum of the vectors. If you want to know the horizontal, the horizontal component of all the forces added together, add all the horizontal components together with the right sign. So if fx is two newtons this way and there's another force which is three newtons that way, then the sum of those two would be one newton that way. Because of these two and the fact that this is a vector equation, I can write the x component as the force, total force in the x direction times the time over which the interaction takes place. Delta T is the time over which that force uh, is, over which the interaction takes place that, that I care about. The force might be applied for other times, but the momentum changes over whatever time I choose to, to worry about. So what does this momentum chart tell you? It, it, it gives you a way of calculating what two things that are really important. One is, what's the momentum at the end for two objects? That might be something interesting. Given that these two objects interacted with each other, what's the momentum of the two at the end? But just as important, maybe even more important, is this change in momentum. The reason that central the central column here, the change in momentum is so important, is that the change in momentum is exactly the thing that tells you about forces. If you want to know the force on me when I turned around and started walking the other way, worry about how much my momentum changed and the time. How fast did it take me to turn around? How much time did it take me to turn around? Those two things together will tell you how much force it took to turn me around. And that force had to come from something. Some object outside of me interacted with me and caused me to turn around. And if, if you wonder what that is, think of me trying to do that if I were on a really slippery ice. Because I would do this and I would try to turn around and my feet would go that way and I would drop right to the ground. I wouldn't be able to just turn around and go the other way and the reason that I wouldn't is on really slippery ice is because that friction force with the ground wouldn't be there. And so what is causing me to turn around is the fact that my shoes don't slip against the floor. So I do something tricky and my shoes don't slip and suddenly I'm going that way. So the force comes from outside somewhere, outside of me. I can't turn myself around or lift myself up just with the forces inside me. I wish I could, but I can't. Yeah? So in DL we had a question that involved a rocket in outer space. So is that a situation where it's the force to change direction could come from inside of the object or is that? The, so 
the rocket in outer space, I mean, that's a really good one. What happens? The, the rocket is moving along with some fuel inside it. It lights the fuel so the gas gets really hot, the gas shoots out the backside, and the rocket goes faster. So if you say that the rocket and the gas are both a part of your system, then there's nothing from the outside, and if there's no forces from the outside, your conclusion has to be that the momentum of that system didn't change. And so what you end up with is down here, delta P is zero, but just because the momentum of that whole system didn't change, doesn't tell you what happened to the momentum of the two pieces, because that's what counts. When you're in the rocket and you light the fuel so gas shoots out, you don't care about the gas anymore. You're fine if the gas just shoots out the back. The reason, what you, the reason you did that is so your rocket would go faster forward. So the total momentum of the rocket does not change because there's nothing from the outside that's changing it. The total momentum, sorry, rocket plus gas. The total momentum of the system rocket plus gas doesn't change. But the rocket goes faster one way and the gas, or changes its momentum one way, and the gas changes its momentum equal and opposite the other way. There was, there's a really famous uh, New York Times article, or editorial actually, from the, from the early 20th century, you could probably Google it. Um, the New York Times wrote an editorial saying that, that rockets uh, these, these people trying to build rockets that will work in space are, it's, it's all nonsense because everyone knows that the gas needs, that rockets need to push against something. And, and, and so that can't work in outer space where there's nothing to push against. Well, it's, however true that might be that the rocket needs to push against something, it doesn't need to push against the ground. It can push against the gas. The gas goes flying that way, the rocket goes flying the other way. And the New York Times, it's not the only time, but the New York Times had, had egg on their face about that one, about not understanding Newtonian physics. Um, so I hope that you guys wouldn't ever make a, of course you've, you know that there are spaceships, so uh, it, it, it's, it's hard not to, not to know what the right answer is today. But the important thing is that the change in momentum, this center one, is related to the total force acting on the object. So, questions for you. This, is not, this one's not even about physics. This is about you. I want you to think about how it feels to sit in a car when you're just uh, motionless. When the car is motionless. And then pick one of the following, so, so pick one of the following situations where what you feel is the closest to what you feel when the car is motionless. So A, just after the light, uh, a, a light turns green and you're accelerating your Ferrari rapidly but you've only gotten up to five miles an hour. So you're going slow. You were going zero. Now you're going slow, but you stomped on the accelerator. So it got there in really in a hurry. It got to five miles an hour in almost no time. B, you're moving at 60 miles an hour, and you hit the brakes really hard because you need to stop, and so you're going five miles an hour. This is the t a time when you're going five miles an hour but you're almost stopped. So you were going really fast, you stomped on the brakes, you're still holding the brakes down, you've gotten down to five miles an hour, but you're not stopped yet. So those are both slow, those are both five miles an hour is how fast you're going in those two. And the last one, uh, you're traveling down a smooth horizontal road in your Lexus at a constant 155 miles an hour. I, I don't know, I'm sure there's a Lexus that'll do that, I don't know which one. 